Hello, we are back for the last little bit. So GPUs. So I can say I'm a person that hasn't used GPUs very much. So my main questions from the next sections would be, if I have code that already uses GPU, what options in Slurm do I need? Um, how do I monitor their performance? And what do I need in my own software or Python environments or whatever in order to use these? Um, so do you think we can go over that? And yeah, anything else yeah I think, think that's a, I think that's a great task list for this uh, yeah. session. Do you want to throw into my screen and maybe I can? Sure. Here we go. OK, yeah. there you go. Yeah, so TPUs, uh, this is like the uh, like a uh, topic with lots of interest and lots of things to cover. But hopefully we can get it uh, get through like the most important things in, in this um, this session. So so what are TPUs? We already talked about it. They're basically the the chicken skewers of the <laughs> of the <laughs> okay yeah. Uh, yeah, like the parallel, massive parallel processors that do this one thing very good. And and the one thing that they do good is the matrix multiplication and that sort of stuff. So they they do they do that that very well. And that's why they're used in all kinds of codes from physics to deep learning and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to use them because they make stuff go room, basically. Mm -hmm. So uh when we want the GPUs, like that's how Slurm thinks about them, how Slurm knows about them. It knows about them in these so-called generic resources. Uh, so, so you need to specifically request for these resources. Okay. There's two ways you can do to request these resources. The yeah. old way uh, is the dash dash grace GPU one. Uh, but the newer way is this dash dash GPU is equal one. Uh, the the newer way, uh, if it's if it's supported, I would personally use that because it also allows you to like if you need to do multi GPU stuff and that sort of stuff later on, it will. Uh, there's other flags that you can use to to make it so that you can like allocate certain number of CPUs per GPU and that sort of stuff. Like you can uh, you can make certain that you your job gets the correct kind of an allocation. So the newer method uh, has more like leeway on that sort, but both work. So you can use whichever one yeah. you want to use. Some clusters okay. have the GPUs in a separate partition. So you might yeah. need to ask for a separate partition. Yeah. Um, in so there. basically it just like processors and memory slurm tracks it and look up your own clusters info for how to request it. And then yes. you got it. Okay. Yeah. Seems and when the, easy. yeah, and when Slurm allocates a job, it basically makes certain that okay, you get like you get access to it, and nobody else get access to it. Uh, so then, then you will get access to the GPU. In our cluster, there's also this uh, debug partition that you can use to debug uh, short jobs, which is very nice if you want to do a small debug run, see that your code runs, and then just like stop it, and then put the actual run going. Uh, because the GPUs are very popular, so sometimes there's lots of people in the queue. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, let's 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 jump jump right in and and let's start dealing with the like the actual problems of the GPU computing or the actual yeah. like things where you <laughs> would need to what you need to think about. Okay. So the the first thing uh, you need to think about is that the GPUs like you cannot simply like talk with the GPU like you would do it uh, like uh, like you cannot write a normal program with them. You need to discuss okay. with the GPU because it's just like a specialized hardware. Okay. You need to use this thing called CUDA toolkit to discuss with that. Mm -hmm. So like because there's so many different like hardwares, there's different kinds of GPUs, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody wants to write to a specific like CPU or GPU architecture. Yeah, like you don't want to write the machine code only for like certain <laughs> GPU architecture, what the people at NVIDIA has have created, and which is probably their best product, 
uh, like even more important, I would say maybe than the actual actual hardware, is this kind of like uh, development kit called CUDA, dev like CUDA development kit, that basically can handle whatever GPU you have underneath it. So the CUDA development kit is is this kind of like a uh, like a thing that that makes it possible for your code to discuss with the GPU okay. and and what if you have a program that uh, yeah. is like you need to if you have a program that is like low level program you need to compile your code for a specific for the yeah. GPU so here's an so, example of a like an so so is this like there's the driver on the node itself but depending on what GPU you're using there might be different driver versions so the toolkit translates mm. your program to what's needed for this particular model of GPU with these particular driver versions. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll show this picture already. Uh, so okay. there's, there's this a picture. Yeah. Yeah. There's a picture of how the thing actually works. So, so mm. what there is in the G, like in the uh, machine, you have the GPU connected to the, like yeah. the motherboard of the machine. And in the operating system, there's this CUDA driver. Mm -hmm. And this CUDA driver can then discuss with the GPU, but you don't want to code your code for this CUDA driver because like the driver might be updated, right? Like Richard said, it might be updated. It might be different. Mm -hmm. The GPU underneath is mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you go into a different computer, it might be a different GPU. So you don't want to like lock yourself only to the specific hardware configuration that you have a hardware and operating system configuration you want yeah so what what the programs usually do like like for example pytorch or something they don't actually talk with the driver that much they don't they don't deal with that they actually uh, are written with respect to the CUDA libraries so like libraries like kublas and qft that implement certain like mathematical operations that mm -hmm. run on on gpus and then the runtime library that can be called to let's say give information is there a gpu available mm -hmm. so the, this uh, topmost part is usually like specific your for your program so 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 like you have a program and that program needs to be that's that that program is compiled against a certain version of CUDA toolkit usually and the driver can handle multiple different toolkits and and then like handle the the discussion between the uh program and the and the GPU basically and, and the CUDA toolkit and yeah. the and the GPU. So so if we look at the example, uh, if we quickly go uh, okay. show it. Yeah. So in this example, we are dealing with quite low level like CUDA code. So for this we need to compile it actually. Okay. So for the compilation, I need to uh, load certain modules, so a compiler and a CUDA toolkit. So this CUDA toolkit, like I'm now in the uh, in the uh, login node of of the cluster. So this doesn't have a GPU available, but I have okay. a CUDA toolkit, so I can compile my code with respect to this CUDA toolkit. Uh, so it's okay. It, yeah, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. linking to that, mm -hmm. and for that. And and for because there's no GPU available, I need to tell my my compilation that I need it to to work with different kinds of GPU architectures. So I need to give this kind of a monstrosity of a command that okay, build build my code so that it runs on these different kinds of GPU architectures. Yeah. So so this is the kind of stuff that usually happens. <laughs> Like that somebody else has done for you. Okay, Usually yeah. you don't have to like write these kinds <laughs> okay. of commands. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, crazy hopefully. long line. Yeah. Like you can, uh, there, there's a, a link to article about this. Well, what are these architectures? Uh, that is great article that I always use as a reference, yeah. like to, to check which GPUs these uh, architectures, like mm -hmm. what, well, what, okay. what yeah. do they mean? So now that we have the, program like we have this compiled py that gpu okay. yeah we can run it with the gpu so basically what i'm asking is one gpu and and then we can run it okay yeah and and 
it's in the queue and it's done and it's done basically instantaneously. Yeah. And because GPUs are so fast, so this number is pretty similar that we run with the CPUs. So let's add like few zeros <laughs> here. Okay. Yeah. And let's run it with the GPU and it's basically done. That's so, still instant, basically. Yeah, it's basically like instant. So this yeah. this is like a lot faster than the Python code that we previously mm -hmm. run. Uh, like in order to get like actual some runtime, well, okay. we need to add more zeros. Yeah. Um, but but this is a lot of work, right? Like the mm -hmm. the compilation and that sort of like writing the code as as this kind of like C code, yeah. and then writing the the co like the dealing with the CUDA and, and most of mm -hmm. the programs that use GPUs don't do this. They are built against a certain version of CUDA toolkit, yeah. and then we just like. Like they come uh, from whoever else provides them. They're yeah, built against yeah. a certain version. Okay, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say we have this now this program. The second question you asked at the start of this session was uh, how to do monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our cluster, there's this monitoring script that because we did release an installation, it currently doesn't work but we will fix it. But there's another way that you can do a monitoring, which is like going to the compute node yeah. while the uh, while the job is running. Okay. And this works with other jobs as well. Uh, in different clusters, you might have a different way of uh, working, in, uh, working mm -hmm. on it. I'll add a few zeros here so that it actually runs okay. uh, a bit longer. So you notice that my job is now running. Like I have yeah. an interactive job running. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll open a new terminal and I can use the slurm queue to check where which node it is running okay. in. Yeah. And while the job is running, I'm allowed to go there. And what happens is that I'm basically going to the same reservation. Mm -hmm. So I'm using the same resources. So if I start new programs, they're, yeah. they're basically taking resources away from the <laughs> The, uh, the program that is uh, uh, that I'm currently okay. running in the yeah. queue. And in here, I can use this tool called NVIDIA SMI, which is provided by the driver, mm -hmm. uh, NVIDIA driver. And it will tell me uh, the usage uh, or the utilization. Yeah. So if I okay. make this a bit bigger, you can see this sort of an output. So what we see here is that the GPU name, we have a certain GPU name. Uh, we have a yeah. GPU number. We have the power usage and that sort of stuff. We have a memory usage. And then we have this GPU utilization. And it, yeah. this basically means that is the GPU actually doing something? Mm -hmm. And okay. and below here, we see the processes that are actually using the GPU. Yeah. So, so this can be used as this kind of like a like a measurement thing that you can you can go there and check is is it actually doing something yeah so i see it says a hundred percent usage here is yes. that typical like do most people's uh, gpu jobs hit 100 percent? no no <laughs> like okay. for for physics code and that sort of code it it can get to to the hundred percent or close to the hundred percent but in many cases the situation is that uh you don't necessarily reach the hundred percent, and the reason for this is that quite often uh, the GPUs need something to work on. So if you're dealing with, let's say, um, uh, deep learning um, code, if we look at the this picture uh, above here, mm -hmm. mm, the program this one. memory RAM. Okay, yeah, yeah. So in many cases, you have a situation where you your program, let's say a deep learning code, it will need to like pass a data set or process a data set that is then used for the deep learning pro like the process. Um, and for this to happen, the CPU part of the program usually needs to load data in and process that data and then send it to the GPU for the calculation. Yeah. And and this uh, if there's a, like a if the GPU doesn't have enough data, it will just idle and wait for the CPU to mm -hmm. to process the data. So what can happen is that the GPU utilization gets low because the CPU part hasn't 
done its job okay, fast yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. So it's so, like, I think something you've said before, the GPU is so fast, it can, what's the thing? Resource starvation. So the CPU yes. can't pump data yeah. into it fast enough to... Yeah. Okay. And yeah. that that means that in many cases, like when using GPU code, the actual thing you're coding is is the left part of this program. You're trying to get, let's say, a data loading system to, to work so that you get enough data for the GPU. And this also means that, like, when you're going from, let's say, your workstation to working on a cluster, you might encounter a situation where your code is slower again on the GPU. And, and you might wonder, like, what's happening? Like, I thought these GPUs are really powerful. Why is it slower? And the reason isn't that the GPU is bad or slower the reason is that the data isn't close to the uh, gpu okay. yeah so often you need to copy let's say the data sets to the lo local uh, local drive in these machines so all of our gpu machines have a local ssd drive there so yeah. that you can use that as this kind of like a buffer uh, for your yeah. data so that you can fill out the gpu fast enough uh, yeah. Because otherwise the GPU will be starving and it it won't um, yeah. get enough data. And often you want to also utilize this multi CPU, uh, like the shared memory parallelism mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. where you have multiple data loaders give, feeding one GPU enough yeah. stuff. Yeah, and this is like a whole can, can of worms. But basically nowadays, uh, often okay. GPU programming isn't actually programming on the GPU, you have some existing library that uses GPU or framework like PyTorch. And then you have, you try to like make certain that the GPU has enough stuff to do. Yeah. So in the pasta metaphor, if we're in this restaurant, mm. we have the chicken cooker and the chicken cooker can cook 20 chickens at once, but we don't have enough chickens in our restaurant so every time it's like oh we don't have enough and you send someone to the store to go buy some and come yeah. back and put them on yeah yeah but by the time That's they get a... back they need even more so okay go to the store again yeah. and come back yeah. and yeah yeah and data that's, transfer... that's an excellent yeah that's excellent and compared to the speed of a processor data transfer is slow really slow mm. um I linked some slides up above that expanded yeah. on the kitchen metaphor. And yeah. it was really surprising to me how slow the processing yeah. or the data there's transfer all, really is. There's this, there's this uh, adage in, in high performance computing that computing is fast, but pipes are slow. <laughs> so so basically yeah. like everything yeah. that needs to transfer data is, is, is like, that's the part where it, the stuff usually gets slow. So, so yeah. in the case of a GPU, the problem usually is that, like that stuff, the slow part isn't the GPU. Mm -hmm. The slow part isn't the GPU memory, or not even the transfer from the CPU memory to the GPU part. Mm -hmm. The slow part is outside of this picture, some hard drive <laughs> or something yeah. that you need to transfer stuff to the C CPU memory, and that's usually the the bottleneck in this case situation. There's also a great question in the chat of of do you need to separately reserve a memory for the uh, for the GPU? And the question is, uh, or the answer is no. Like, <clears throat> you you will get the whole GPU memory. So if you, mm -hmm. if you, let's say I run here GPUs, one NVIDIA SMI. I will just run the monitoring uh, program. So you notice that this run on a V100 uh, with 16 gigabytes of memory. So all of this VRAM in the GPU, it's it's for mine to use. And so it's it's uh, all of this memory here is is mine for you for use, even though mm. I didn't request uh, CP memory. That yeah. Much. So quite um... often. Yeah. Unlike the normal processor in one of our computers, which can be shared by many things, the GPU is always one GPU, one person, no sharing. Yeah. Okay. And and also yeah. I will mention that like quite often you still need to reserve quite a bit of memory because, for example, in order to load like a 
like a large language model or something, mm -hmm. you need to first load it from the disk, load it into the memory, and then give it to the GPU memory. So you need to reserve enough memory so that like the stuff can fit into the CPU's RAM before it's transferred into the GPU's RAM. Mm -hmm. And and when it the, these memory considerations are quite important when it comes to these big models, or if you want to do like large day, lots of uh, large data processing, you need more and more memory. And many of these like large language models, for example, they re might require so much memory that they don't fit into one GPU. Mm -hmm. So you you have to use multiple GPUs to, to okay. run those. Yeah. Okay. I actually uh, feel like I understood more than when I started, especially about the, um, well, mainly about the toolkit um, and the library yeah. things. There's also okay. one excellent question that can you get an interactive session on a GPU? And, and the answer is in principle, yes, yeah. but I would highly recommend not doing that. The first thing is that for the reason that the GPUs are very like important for, for many like calculations, are they're very expensive. There's like internal billing in Slurm that, that basically your priority in the queue is just determined by the resources you use. And because the GPUs are so important, the uh, the the billing for the GPUs is higher. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the GP, so so basically, if you use one one hour of CPU interactively, you're basically like using like eighty hours of CPU uh, time, basically. So there's this kind of like a like a billing factor there. So it will like lower your priority a lot. Mm -hmm. And and secondly, uh, again, like if you're using it interactively, nobody else can use it. Yeah. So what I personally mm -hmm. usually like to do is I write my stuff, then I run it with S run or something like that, and see how it performs. And let's mm -hmm. say I want to do like a deep learning training or something. Yeah, it's enough for me to know that the training starts, to know that my code is correct, and then I can like submit a longer job. So okay. usually like. Yeah. If I want to just like test it out, I can test out like half an epoch or one an epoch, one epoch mm -hmm. or something like that, and test out interactively this very short time, and then actually submit it yeah. for a longer time and not reserve it constantly because like then my priority will suffer and yeah. other people cannot use the mm -hmm. uh, the GPUs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... So yeah, was that I... all the most important things that I had said? So so it, let's say there's some yeah. existing program like a Python program that uses GPUs. I've, I want to use PyTorch. So what do I need to do to make that work? Yes. So so this this is the bane of uh, of many people's existence uh, that that like what actually happens. And one person in the chat was already discussing like they have a specific case where they want to use TensorFlow and PyTorch. Both of these are these kind of like uh, deep learning frameworks and some extra packages on top of it. And it's a lot of work to get that installed and getting that working. And that is a complicated thing to do. And we have some pre-installed environments, but they don't, of course, contain your custom packages. And because it's so complicated, Usually, we recommend that people install their own environments. Uh, in some sites, uh, the recommended way is to install these environments in containers. For example, in CSC, uh, the recommended way, because they all of these environments can create millions of files, and mm -hmm. it can cause some problems. But but the recommended way usually is to use these like. Uh, so we exam we for example recommend using Conda a lot which is this mm -hmm. kind of like framework that can provide already installed, already compiled yeah. binaries for you easily. So, and yeah, there's a yeah. question here. So every time you want to use GPUs, you first need to load module load GCC CUDA, but with yeah. Python or things, you don't need to. Yes. That's uh, yeah. And this yes, brings you don't. Yes. Okay. So, so if you want to use GPUs, and you want to compile yourself, 
you need to take the like the develop load the development kit. So basically these parts. This this is provided by the module load CUDA. It yeah. provides this part. And then you can create your program uh with respect to these. Mm -hmm. But but if you have an already existing program, let's say PyTorch or framework like PyTorch and or mm -hmm. TensorFlow, what you want to do is that you want to install the program and you want that program to decide okay i want the the cuda toolkit that that i've been compiled against so it mm -hmm. instead of going from bottom up you go from top to bottom so you you first decided okay i want pytorch mm -hmm. and what cuda toolkit does my pytorch need and then you let a uh, packaging manager like conda decide which cuda toolkit fits with the with the PyTorch. So you don't start with some, like you don't basically force uh, the program to use uh, a certain CUDA toolkit. You yeah. you let okay. the program decide what uh, CUDA toolkit it needs. So this is like and the dependencies should be declared properly and then it yes. works. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so there's, uh, there's some instructions in our, uh, pages in our uh, like conda page we have a separate page for how to use conda in our cluster uh, and how you can get the the corresponding cuda toolkit and if you are using these environments you should not load the cuda because then you have double the toolkits yeah. and now the programs don't know what they should be using yeah. and everything gets like super complicated and like you should always have only one cuda toolkit either from the module system or yeah. provided by the uh, provided by the um, the yeah. the the Conda installation. Mm -hmm. There's also a question about MATLAB, and MATLAB is is different because it it does just in time compilation. Uh, so so it will use the modules, uh, module CUDA. Okay. So what MATLAB does is that when you com create your MATLAB uh, GPU arrays, for example, mm -hmm. it will just in time compile these uh, for, uh, like when it, when it needs them it will compile a code that uses them uh, when it's running so so it will need the the module system once mm -hmm. but but like yeah. this is this is a bit of a mess like yeah. right like like there's so many different ways of getting these uh, yeah. toolkits and and basically it means that Oops. Uh, it basically means that whenever you want to install PyTorch, you need to get like a few gigabytes of toolkits usually. <laughs> and okay. and this is currently yeah. the situation. But the reason behind this is that it's so much faster to work with, let's say, a framework like like PyTorch or TensorFlow or something, and write your code in this higher level, higher like level language like Python. Instead of like going to the C route and writing everything okay. against the CUDA yeah. toolkit. 